Uh, we're in the book of Jonah, and I've kind of slowed this pace down because I like getting to teach the book of Jonah. It's a great opportunity to talk about uh, the gospel, the good news that God became one of us, died for all of us, so that if anyone would give their heart to him and life to him, they would be born again. And the book of Jonah is the most clear picture of the gospel, I think, or one of the most clear pictures of the gospel in the Old Testament, so much so that in the book of Matthew, Jesus said, just as Jonah was in the belly of a great fish for three days and three nights, so the Son of Man will be. And he was describing his death, his burial, and his resurrection. So he actually highlights the story of Jonah as a way of connecting our understanding to the idea of him dying, being buried, and then rising again. And we looked last week at verses 1 and 2. I don't normally go this slow, not that it's bad or good, just as I don't normally go this slow, but there's so many things, are kind of topics that I think are important for us to be able to grasp, and it's important that we take the time to do that, especially when we're talking about the good news. So I'd like to read Jonah chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, and then we will talk about it. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three-day journey in extent. And Jonah began to enter the city on the first day's walk. And he cried out and he said, Yet forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Verse 5. So the people of Nineveh believed God, proclaimed a fast, and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. And this is the passage that I'd like us to focus our attention on. I mentioned last week from verses 1 and 2 the idea of how patient and how just kind God is because the first time that God told Jonah to go to Nineveh, he refused and he, and he moved, he went in the exact opposite direction. Jonah was swallowed by this great fish and now three days later, Jonah is now kind of spit out and dropped out coincidentally at Nineveh. Not coincidentally, he's now at Nineveh. He's like, comes out and he's like, what just happened? And it's like, welcome to Nineveh, sign. <laughs> like, okay. And God, and we saw this last week, was so patient and so kind to Jonah. Instead of saying, Jonah, you're a bum and I'm done with you and I'm moving on to somebody else, God says to Jonah, and he, it says to him here, he came to him a second time and he said, now I want you to go and preach to Nineveh. No sense of judgment no sense of, you know, you should feel bad for what a loser you are for not doing what I told you to do. None of that. Just direct, like, hey, do you remember I told you that before? Let's try again. I want you to go talk to the people in Nineveh. And this time we read that Jonah obeys. Now, I mentioned this to you a couple weeks ago near the beginning of the book of Jonah, that a lot of the writing in this book is very satirical. It's very, it's very drastic. It's very dramatic. And I don't mean fake or false, but it's, it's written in such a way to make us really pay attention. In fact, let me, let me, I'll put these up on the screen. I want you to notice how often we see these exaggerated, these kind of big ideas or words. The city of Nineveh is referred to as large. It's a large city. The task that Jonah assigned to was a large task. The fear that the sailors experienced was a large fear, a great fear. The fish that God sent was a large fish. It was going to have to be. The effect of, of Jonah's sermon was massive, and we're going to talk about that a bit today. The repentance of the people was incredible. And then finally, we're going to see it, and we're not, not today, but we will see this. Jonah's anger at God not destroying Nineveh was unbelievable. It was huge. He was so mad, and we're going to get to it when we get to chapter 4. He was so mad at God for being gracious. Why does this matter? Because this story of the, go of the gospel through the book of Jonah reminds us of how great our need for God is and how great God's redemption is. 
And we're going to look at three different areas today. We're going to look at three things today. Our great need, God's great love and grace, and God's great mission. And we'll get to each one of those. But you have to see that the, the extent to which you and I appreciate how much we need God will be in direct correlation to our understanding and appreciation of how much we are in need of him. In other words, oh man, God is so great is in direct connection to my ability to say, man, I really need God. When I have this approach of like, I'm good, I'm doing good, you're doing good, life's good, we're good. I'm going to miss out on how important it is for me to have a relationship with God. And as I understand the greatness of God, I see the greatness of my need for God. And we talked about this for several weeks, that our hearts... That was the John Calvin quote that the human heart is an idol faking, uh, as an idol making factory. Not idol faking, idol making. We make idols. We produce idols when we're unspiritual or outside of religion or outside of faith. We have our idols. But even inside faith, inside those who have a spiritual relationship with God, we can create our own idols as well. The human heart gravitates towards idol making. It's why we're constantly expected to realize our need for God. We shouldn't ever, you know, Sunday morning should be the gathering of a group of people who are like, I need God. It's not the gathering of a bunch of people who are like, I'm better or I'm good. Oh, you're here. You're good too. But the church gathers because we realize We need God. And so what we see happening here in the book of Jonah is these these just dramatic expressions. It's a large city. It's a large fish. It's a large problem. It's a large repentance. Everything is just, it's everything is, is in big proportion. And that's the way it should be. When you realize that you need God, we realize it's not just like a little need, but it's a Great need for God. And that's where I want to start. There's a great need. You and I and human history tells the story of people having a great need for God. Everybody in the story, everybody in the story of Jonah were messed up. Except for God. But every single one of them. The Ninevites were like they were a train wreck. They were a total mess. I mean, they were powerful. They were uh, definitely on the move of of that part of the world. They were taking things over right, left, and center, but they were a mess. The sailors that took Jonah into their ship, their lives were a wreck. We see it in Jonah 1 and in chapter 2. Jonah was a mess. You see, he was the guy that had the message from God, and yet his own life was in total turmoil. Things were not going that way. He was the man of God. He was the prophet of God. He was the guy with a message, but his own life was just in chaos. And the message of the story of Jonah, at least up to this point, is not Jonah should have been doing good, and he wasn't doing good, so God made him go in a fish to get to... No, no, no. This whole book is a... Is a just a piercing reminder of this one truth over and over and over and over and over. You ready? God, God is better than you and I could ever imagine. He's kinder and he's more gracious to humanity than we could ever imagine. Even the prophet of God, the man who was the voice, you know, the the mouthpiece for God, even that guy missed how good and how gracious God really is. And the point that I want to make to that is this. Anyone you can think of right now, and you don't need to shout it out, we don't need that. Especially if it's like somebody in the room, that would be really bad. But anyone you can think of that you're like, they're so far from God. Their life is a total mess. The the people that you can't stand the most, I got to tell you something. Now, we're at church, we're like, oh, I love everybody. Okay, ask yourself the question tomorrow. Because today we love everybody, right? (laughs) Ask yourself tomorrow, who's the person that I can't stand? And then just do this, like it's a self-reflecting process. Are you ready? Remember that God loves them. Remember that God loves them. You see, we can be shallow and just, oh, I love everybody. 
but this is wrong, and this is evil, and this is bad, and these people, and that people. It's like, well, then let's pull back. Let's retract the love part. God, not in word, but also in deed, actually loves every single human being. And I'm not saying that to say to you, and you should too. I'm trying to make a bigger point than that. We don't. That's the point. We don't have, we do not love as God loves. That's why I'm wanting to be transformed. That's why I'm hoping that each one of us will be transformed. Every single person in the book of Jonah, besides God, was a mess. And each one of them could see the problems in the other person, but not in themselves. And Jesus speaks to that. Like, we are not supposed to be able to pull the speck out of a person's eye when there's a plank in our own eye. Each person had their view of what was wrong with the other person in the book of Jonah. But the moral of the whole story is, let God work in your life. You see, Jonah goes and delivers a message of repentance to the Ninevites, but he himself was unrepentant. He's like, he's out there like, you guys need to repent. Meanwhile, in his heart, he's like, I will not forgive. I will not love these people. He was all angry and bitter. We'll see that when we get to chapter four. Everybody was different. The sailors and the Ninevites were pagan. Jonah was religious. Jonah was conservative. The others were very much not. The gospel reaches in to the hearts of every human being. For God so loved the world. It's easy for us to conclude that the main problem is on the outside. It's so easy to do that. Oh, society is the problem. Society is made up of people. We're a part of that. What I mean is this. It's not only a problem out there. It's a problem right in here. And by the way, I'm not looking at you when I said that. I'll just look inside. You and I have a sin problem. And the answer is always going to be Jesus. And I have a sin problem not as a non-Christian who's never heard the grace of God or the work of God or the forgiveness of God. I still have a sin. I constantly, and the Bible says, be crucified. Die to yourself. Die to the old ways. We're still in the process of being renewed and as the Bible calls it, being sanctified. And as we looked at, a few weeks ago, and I mentioned that scripture to you where the Bible says that judgment begins, or really not like, like, not like um, eternal ending last judgment, but just the work of God begins in the house of God, begins in us. We can pray, oh Lord, we want to see a revival. You know, revival is the word that we use to describe a massive moving of God in our community and in our homes and in our workplaces. We want to see God work in a big way. And friends, it all, it, it, it's, it's so simple and it's so frustratingly simple. It starts with me and you. It just starts in our own hearts. I, I'd love to see God bring revival to, to our community. So I have to say, Lord, do that in me. Make your Life and your word and your will become so fresh and alive into my own heart. It's easy for us to see that people like Jonah are like the, you know, um, I told you a parable last week of the older brother and the younger brother. That It's called the prodigal son. And he ran away from his dad. And then he was feeding and eating from pigsty. And he's like, you know what, I should go home. And he comes home and his dad's, you know, overjoyed that his son has come home, but the older brother, the other brother, is all bitter and angry and upset because he never left. He was a good kid. He stayed, he's like, Dad, I never left you, I was good. And the father says to him, but can't we rejoice that one who was lost has come home? See, I think the thing that you and I are constantly having to remind ourselves of is like, in that parable, we might struggle with, yeah, but I've been good. I've done good. I stayed in the family. Jesus' heart is for you, and it's for those that are on the outside. It's unchanging. Our need for God did not diminish when you gave your life to Christ. You just began to see how much more we actually need God. The second thing I want you to notice here, and we're going to look at it in, in some detail, is I want you to see how great the grace and the love of God is for Jonah, for the Ninevites, and we already saw for these 
sailors. God goes after Jonah. He goes after the sailors, and he went after the Ninevites. When we think of Nineveh alone, we need to remember that this city represented like the, this was like the epicenter of evil from Jonah's perspective. Now, I'm sure there was other people, groups around the world that didn't even know Nineveh existed. So we don't want to make it like, you know, everybody, the world was kind of small in, in thinking at the time. They didn't know each other. But Nineveh, from Jonah's perspective, was the most evil, terrible place you could ever go to. And more than that, Jonah's big concern with Nineveh was not fear of what could happen to him. It wasn't that he was afraid like, oh man, if I go to Nineveh, I could die. You know what Jonah's fear was? If I go to Nineveh, God will forgive them. And I don't want him to. Because they deserve what they're going to get because they're terrible. Now, Jonah didn't say any of that out loud. He certainly didn't say that when he was in the synagogue on Sabbath. He was better than that. He was smarter than that. But he felt it. And it was what everybody was always talking about. And it was consuming. And it was just, it consumed his mind. And then God one day says to him, I want you to go to Nineveh. I'm not going to Nineveh. I'm going in the opposite direction. God's desire to go after Nineveh reminds us that there is no sin. There is no person that is too far from the love of God. God's capacity to forgive is infinitely greater than our capacity to sin. Did you know that? The Bible says in the book of Romans where sin abounds, grace does more abound. And you might hear that and be like, cool, I'm going to go on a sin fest and see how it goes. Obviously, that's not the point. The point isn't to say you could just, just go sin and it doesn't matter, but it is to say this, no matter what you do, God is able to forgive you. He loves you that much. He's that great. You know, the book of Romans, and I want us to look at that book pretty soon, but the book of Romans is one of those really dangerous youth group books to teach because it's like more inviting than adult parents are happy to have. Where sin abounds, grace does more. Don't tell my 16-year-old that. Give him a little bit more like law. (laughs) Put a couple more rules on them. Guys, God will forgive you no matter what. And they're like, yeah, I'm out of here. That's what you think. But you know what really happens? I was a youth pastor long enough, and we've got an amazing group of young people in this room right now. You know what happens when they learn about how forgiving and gracious God is? These people become amazing witnesses to the world around them. Because you see, when you let the grace of God actually get inside, you hear the words, you can do whatever. But when you let God begin to do that work, which so many of our young people are doing, These people are, they're not only being transformed, but they're bringing change in the world that they're in. They're amazing. And that goes for every single one of us. You know, oh, you can do whatever you want. The freedom that you and I have is because we're no longer in bondage to sin anymore. Freedom from bondage is the promise of the cross of Jesus Christ. The grace of God is so great that anyone Anyone who would come to him would be forgiven. Did they deserve it? No, but none of us did. And you see, the work of God, I believe, in our lives is not just to say we believe that, but to actually start believing that. It's a lot harder to do. Oh, God can forgive anybody, and then somebody, you know, and then, and then somebody that you, or some, somebody wears something that you don't like, somebody says something that you don't like. Oh, man, no, 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 no. Friends, there's no one outside of the love and the grace and the kindness, and the compassion of God. No one. And we just have to get it over and over. And the book of Jonah reminds us of that over and over and over. The the, the third point that I want you to see here is the mission of God. It was a great mission. Now, when I say the mission of God, what I'm referring to is something very different than just the mission of Jonah. Jonah. Jonah had a mission. Jonah's first mission was to avoid God's mission. I need to get away from what God wants me to do. That was Jonah's mission. Then Jonah's second mission was to do as little as humanly possible. And so Jonah walks into the city of Nineveh. It's a three-day walk. It's a massive city. Hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people. And Jonah walks in, and in English he says eight words, according to your tra- depending on your translation. You can figure out how many words it is in Spanish. But in English, he says eight words. In Hebrew, 
It's five words. Jonah gives a message, eight, yet 40 days, and Nineveh will be overthrown. 40 days, and Nineveh will be overthrown. That's the whole message. The whole message is in 40 days, Nineveh is going to be overthrown. And then he peace out. He just walks out. That's like if I just, like, my whole message was like, hey, you guys, you all need to repent. <laughs> leave Andy up here wondering, like, do I play a song? Do I leave? What do we do? He's like, everybody have a great day. <laughs> Tithe boxes in the back. You know, I mean, what's... <laughs> What kind of message would that be, right? If I just walked out here and said, you all need to, pre- to repent, you have, you have about 40 days. Some of you are new, you're like, what just happened? What, do, you, do you understand how dramatic this is? He walks in there with, and he does the least amount of work possible. Yet 40 days and God's going to destroy Nineveh. No mention of the love of God. No mention of the forgiveness of God. No, I mean, none of it. It's literally one of the worst messages I've ever heard. And here's what really bothers me about it. I want you to catch this. This is really important. Never one time does God say to Jonah, you preached an incomplete message or the wrong message. It seems like that's exactly what God wanted Jonah to say. And that's a little bit shocking, like, Lord, where's your love? Where's your heart? And this is why it's important that we understand that God is on a great mission. It's important that you understand that God's on a mission that's far bigger, far exceeds any mission you'll be on, any mission I've been on, any mission the whole church of Jesus is on. He's on a much bigger mission. You see, if I were to say to you today, you just need to repent. Bye. Some of you are going to be so offended. Some of you are going to... But, but maybe one of you in here is going to be like, that's exactly what I needed to hear. Somehow, in the sovereignty of God, in the greatness of God, in the all-knowingness of God, he knew that what they needed to hear was yet 40 days, and I'm going to destroy this place. And the whole city freaked out. Look at what it says there in verse 5. It says the people of Nineveh believed God. They believed God. They proclaimed a fast. They put on sackcloth. That means they humbled themselves from the greatest, we're going to see the king in a little bit next week, to the least of them. What I'm trying to say to you is this. We don't understand how it always works, but God knew exactly what the people needed to hear, exactly when they needed to hear it. And Jonah walks in and says, this is what I'm supposed to tell you. And he says it. He walks out angry, and the whole city repents. The whole city repents. You have no idea as a preacher how angry this makes me. I just have to confess my sins to you right now. You have no idea how angry this makes me, okay? I think of so many people in the scriptures who were such better human beings than Jonah. And nobody ever repented when they preached. Jeremiah is one of my favorites. Anybody read the book of Jeremiah? You know, well, you know, let's not raise our hands. And we're like, yeah, I'm better than everybody. No. Um, the book of Jeremiah. I remember reading this book the first time when I got saved and I'm reading it and I didn't have an iPad. I'm reading, and I, I'm reading a printed out Bible and I'm reading it and I'm like, man, this guy's life stinks. Everything goes bad. If you don't know the story of Jeremiah, let me sum it up. Nobody repents. But he keeps preaching, he keeps preaching and then one day there's this thing where it's like, oh, everybody's about to repent. Everybody's about to, to hear the message and then, oh, never mind, it doesn't happen. I remember being so angry I threw the Bible. I was so ticked. I'm like, God, are you kidding me? This is not fair. This dude did everything right. But this is what bothers me about Jonah. It's just me confessing my own sin to you. He didn't do anything right, and God still worked. Because I need to remind myself, and I want to remind you, God is on a mission. Those people in your life that don't know Christ, you think you love them the most. You don't. God does. Oh, that's not supposed to make you go, oh, okay, good, God's got it, I'm out. Because like Jonah, God might be wanting to use you in their life. God knew what the people in Nineveh needed in ways that Jonah didn't even understand. Jonah thought, I'm going to walk in there and tell them a message. Nothing's going to happen. I did it. I did my job. I witnessed to them. This is the worst witnessing I've ever seen. 
I've seen a lot of bad witnessings. I mean it. This is really bad. You're all going to die later. And it worked. And it worked. Because God is on a mission to reach people. And he knew what they needed. And they all began to repent. And you're going to see in a, uh, next week, we're going to see this. There was one person in Nineveh that didn't repent. It was the prophet. It was Jonah. Everybody's repenting. God, we need you. And Jonah's like, hate you, hate you, hate you, hate you, hate you. God, forgive, stop saying that. You know, he's like the Grinch. He's just getting more dark and evil and hard-hearted. And then he's going to get outside of the city and he's going to be like, I hate you, 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 I hate you. And then he's going to sit down and he's going to be like, God, I hate you. That's how hard his heart was. But what I want to remind you today is that wherever your heart is at, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, whatever state the, heart, the human heart is at, he loves us. Whether we're doing amazing or not so amazing, God is on a great mission to rescue people from the grips of hell and from darkness and from the devil and you know what may be most important to you and me today? From the grips of ourselves. He wants to bring freedom and hope. That's the greatness of God's mission in the world today. Right now, those who will never have, you know, we, we, we hear a story about missionaries being kidnapped, but I could, I could quote you a hundred other stories of how God used those same people who were kidnapped to reach their captors may happen, it may not happen this time around. As the Bible says, all to the glory of God. God's working in ways that none of us will ever, one of my favorite missionary stories is of a young man who went to a particular island to reach people with the gospel and, and uh, he, he joined an American ship that was going to try to bring commerce and, and connection to this island and the people didn't want it and they attacked the ship and they burned the ship and as he was getting off of the ship, he's holding all these printed out versions of the Bible in their language and he's like, I'm not, I'm not a soldier, I'm not a bad guy, I'm just here to, I want to help bring the gospel to you and they killed him right there. And the guy who killed him took home all this paper, he's like, man, this would look amazing in my house. No joke, he wallpapered his house with the Bible. His nephew learned to read and read it and got saved. And he started a church. By the way, this is a part of the, the, how the gospel really began to infect Korea. One of the most missionary sending islands, <laughs> if you could use that word, people in the world today. Started by a guy who gave his life to just reaching people. You don't know how your story is going to end and you don't know how the story of the people around you is going to end. Just love people and love God and let him do a great work in each one of our lives. Amen? Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the opportunity to, to be in your word, Lord. I pray that, I pray that Lord, if we're, if we're in a place where we realize that we have a, a great need for you, maybe in a really... Maybe it's really personal to you today. You have a sense that you, you have a great need for God. I want to encourage you. Cry out to him. As we, as we worship the Lord in singing, I want to encourage you. Take that moment and cry out to God. Lord, I need you. Lord, forgive me. Lord, come into my life. Come into my life in a deeper way. Maybe this morning you realize, like you just, you're kind of reminded of the, the greatness of the love of God then just receive that into your own life today, that you're loved, that you're forgiven, that God is for you. This is not, this is not a message to just try to make you feel good like, on an emotional level only, but on a very deep spiritual level, you need to know this. You are accepted by God. You are not an afterthought and you are not a problem. You are loved by God. Finally, maybe today you need to be, you've been reminded of the mission of God, that God is at work. People in your life, people around you. He'll never leave or forsake you, but that goes for them too. 
And so, Father, we, we just commit our morning and thank you, Lord, for being present and being present in your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for joining us, whether online or in person. We pray that the ministry of Calvary San Diego is encouraging you in your faith. If you would like to follow along with what we are doing or hear more teachings, you can do so by downloading the Calvary SD mobile or TV app. Also, if you would like to partner with us and worship through giving, you can do so at calvarysd.com give. Thanks for tuning in.